Jacob Steves, founder of BitTensor. Welcome to Real Vision Crypto Daily Briefing. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. I'm really excited to talk about these topics today. The union of AI and machine learning, artificial intelligence, and so much more. But first, I want to take a look at price action today. Bitcoin trading right now at 26,888. We've lost the 27 handle there. On the last 24 hours, it's down uh, about a tenth of a percent, trailing seven days, up about two and a half percent. Ethereum, we're off the 19 handle, trading right now at 1,862, up on a trailing 24 hour basis, about a quarter of a percentage point, trailing seven days, a little bit better, up 4% trailing seven days on Ethereum. Jacob, lots to talk about here. Uh, exciting technology. I found this a really interesting topic. I'm excited to have you here. I should say, of course, it's very early with this technology, not an endorsement of any technology, and of course, never an endorsement of any token. But Jacob, tell us a little bit about what you guys are doing over at BitTensor. Well, hopefully we can have a conversation that raises those prices, uh, Ash. Um, what we're doing at BitTensor is we're, we're revolutionizing artificial intelligence the way that we can create it and distribute it to people. We're using peer-to-peer -peer technology to make it so that we can, can combine compute computation from across the globe and incentivize it into a single neural network so that people can access it anywhere in the world. <clears throat> and it's open, really open, unstoppably open. So that's, that's BitTensor in a nutshell. So let's talk a little bit about the evolution of the technologies. We're chatting a little bit about this offline before we started the show today. Talk about your involvement in Bitcoin and the notion of what happens to all of that compute power that essentially is just about finding and guessing random numbers. Yeah, well, I won't speak badly about Bitcoin because I think that Bitcoin solves a really important problem with inside the space. And, and it's not exactly wasted computation in the sense that it secures Bitcoin's network, which I think is right. the under, you know, it underpins all of this entire industry. Right. If Bitcoin was gone, we'd, we'd have a problem, all of us, because we wouldn't have a safe haven asset um, that we can always be sure that can't be taken out by governments. <clears throat> I think that Bitcoin really solves a core problem. But, but what, is, what was shown by Bitcoin was the ability to uh, use incentivization to draw together hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars of compute um, every day to hash uh, that, that particular token. <clears throat> and, and we can use that to solve other problems in machine learning, specifically for inferencing technology like large language models. And that's what we do on, on BitTensor. We also use, the the use that compute to train machine learning models. <clears throat> the largest supercomputer in the world is Bitcoin. And it is that way because it's a permissionless system, one that any computer in the world can, can, can join. There is no bureaucracy. There's no one that you have to ask in order to enter that system. And you can get paid for the work that you do. So it's a very liquid, permissionless system. And that's what draws together all of this computation uh, and allows <clears throat> to be used by that, by that uh, network. So we, we really just borrow that same technological foundation, that same structure of computation um, as the underpinning of our technology. But it also brings with it a lot of different uh, ethical considerations when, when, when it comes to a technology. Because it's run on a foundation that every single person can own, a foundation that anybody can contribute to, we're inherently open in a different way than, say, a company that just allows you to contribute but not own. So let's talk a little bit about the functional mechanics that are operating right now uh, within the BitTensor network. Talk about what precisely it does uh, in terms of creating value with the computational power. Mm -hmm. So we, we are measuring computers' ability to inference these large language models. So a large language model is like GPT-3, GPT-4, GPT-5. We, we measure their ability to inference them. And inferencing is when you take an input, pass it through the neural network and get the output. It's, it's really quite an expensive operation because it involves um, trillions of, of floating point operations in the case of, of larger models. <clears throat> and, and that output is very valuable. It's the thing that we go to when we use a technology like OpenAI's chat GPT. Uh, it's also the the deep expense for companies like that that are are expending millions and millions, hundreds of millions of dollars per year just to give access to these large language models. <clears throat> you're, so, you're talking about the referencing the underlying compute power that drives those LLMs. Yeah. So so we we by building markets around these the ability to inference these language models, like say a ChatGPT, 
we can force our miners to do that for us in a collective uh, and combine the results into a system that is maybe even um, more performant or certainly more expansive than, than any other project on Earth. Let me just read directly from the white paper, which I was checking out earlier this morning. Uh, quote, a new commodity needs a new type of market. This paper suggests a framework in which machine intelligence is measured by other intelligence systems. Models are ranked for information production regardless of subjective task or data set used to train them. By changing the basis which machine learning is measured, the market can, one, intelligence, which is applicable to a much larger set of problems. Uh, two, legacy systems can be monetized for their unique value. And three, smaller, diverse systems can find niches within a much higher resolution reward landscape. Let's talk about that resolution reward landscape and the market that this creates. Talk about the framework for machine intelligence being measured by other intelligence systems. Right. I think you, to understand that best, you can compare it to what we have as a system right now. So we, we have a system of benchmarking. There's a set of benchmarks that we use to, to um, rank language models, for instance. Uh, and machine learning engineers team up in, in research organizations and try to compete on those, those benchmarks. In, in BitTensor, we have an incentivized benchmarking system that also combines the, the outputs of some models with others. So in this system that's incentivized and also combinatorial, people can find solutions with inside this market and get paid for it. So there's an ability for a machine learning engineer to come to BitTensor and provide their, in, their innovation, their expertise, their compute, whatever, whatever it is, um, to this network and get paid for it uh, uh, in, in a different way than they would through a traditional academic system, which is sort of locked by, by the need to run these, these academic benchmarks. <clears throat> and and the, when it comes to things like changing the reward landscape, what we have right now is very interesting with BitTensor is we have this large network, which is an incentive mechanism. And we have thousands of people out there that are trying to compete inside it. And what shows up in that ecosystem is nothing that we would ever be able to predetermine. We, we wouldn't be able to foresee what would show up. And what, but instead, people that are driven by the self-interest, by driven, that are driven by markets, come up with super intuitive ways of solving the core problem. In this case, the core problem is, is how can we inference these comp computational models <clears throat> very quickly and efficiently. So, so that's what BitTensor is solving. That's where the market is, is situated. And, and where, however we, we direct that market, the, the community will optimize it. In the same way that for, for say, Bitcoin, the market is towards hashes. And then the global community works its way around trying to create those hashes more efficiently and, and way more efficiently than, say, any, any centralized corporation could attain. I mean, I like... Um, Andre Antonopoulos's quote that, that, that there's no way that the United States would be able to take over Bitcoin because can you imagine a bureaucracy like the United States being able to source the hashing power that's required to, to take on the largest miners? All of these you know, disparate, hyper-efficient corporations that are driven by um, a profit motive underneath an incentive mechanism. And, and so that's the technology that we're using. We're marrying the, the incentive um, that drove Bitcoin and ap applying it to <clears throat> the, the underlying methods of incentivizing machine intelligence. So how can we drive the production of machine intelligence with inside of our of our peer-to-peer -peer network? How can we pull out um, the highest quality models into our ecosystem? Um, and that's what we see. So like when we built our latest network that was designed to do chat completions, the ability to answer questions efficiently and, and also information um, dense, we, we found that people were able to go and find the models that would fit into that network. So they could, they, they, they ran the Falcom 40 billions and they ran the stability AI and the Vicuñas and they, and they, they hooked up the Claude um, API endpoints into the network and to get paid for it. So we extracted all of this intelligence value through the network by just aligning the incentives with this thing that we wanted to produce, which was, you know, inferences per second. I mean, I say that's quite technical, but really that's what we are measuring because it's the inferencing of the machine learning models that produces the actual intelligence, you could say. So we, that's what we measure. And then behind the scenes, people fine tune these models, they, they train their own, uh, they procure uh, all of this value into the system and make it open to the people that are holding tau.
So let me ask you this, uh, in terms of markets and incentivization, that's sort of what pulled me down this rabbit hole in 2017 when I got interested in Bitcoin myself, because I just thought it was such an incredibly interesting and elegant system uh, to incentivize people uh, to secure the network. Walk us through a specific example of how this uh, type of commodity works in the case of BitTensor uh, in terms of the actual functional mechanics of the model, mm. what it's being solved for, who the participants are, what the market activity is, uh, and how value gets generated in that process. Well, I mean, I think people understand what's being created by technologies like ChatGPT, the ability to create bots that are assistants um, for you. And, and we, we are building a, a number of those technologies on top of, of, of BitTensor. There's multiple companies that are building API endpoints, keeping them open or closed or paid or whatever. Um, running on top of our infrastructure. So that that's something that we can create and we can do it in a way that no particular organization owns. Uh, that's really interesting. And it's also adapting and growing and becoming better every single day. Jacob, there, are there functional examples of that uh, that exist today where people can actually go and experiment with the technology, uh, attempt to generate value in terms of artificial intelligence from some of these applications today? Yeah, there's, there's a number of uh, assistants that, that people have made. There is they're all kind of coming out right now because this tech mm. we've just recently uh, poked our head into the completion um, arena which allows people to 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 use the technology um in a way that makes much more sense to a user before we were working on numerical embeddings so it's it's much more machine learning operations style understanding it's very it's very like okay what is an embedding that that won't really hit um, many of the viewers here won't really understand what that is but it's a core machine learning tool uh, for doing things like sentiment analysis now we're working with the uh, alongside embeddings, the ability to to actually generate text to answer questions. Um, these kind of things are what are what we are incentivizing the miners to produce. And so from there, we can actually build applications, all sorts of applications. So, I mean, you've seen the, a lot of them over the last you know month or so. Things like Auto GPT and Baby AGI. Uh, these are all technologies built on that fundamental uh, commodity. So these are technologies that are using BitTensor as part of the value creation chain. Well, they're they're literally hosted on top of BitTensor, so they're uncensorable versions of those applications. It's an auto GPT that 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 no one can turn off. I think that's kind of cool. There's you know in the same way that Ethereum built contracts that were unstoppable, we, we people can build AIs which are unstoppable in a similar way on top of on top of BitTensor because the, it's not run by any particular individual. So how does that work in terms of the incentivization and the compute power that's expended uh, to process this? Obviously, folks know that uh, LLMs require a great deal of training, uh, obviously mm -hmm. very computationally intensive. Talk a little bit about how that substrate works. Right. Well, the expense for LLM training tra it, for LLMs is, is definitely the training. The training is very expensive, but inferencing is also really expensive. Let's, so let's talk about what that means and define inferencing mm -hmm. for folks who don't have the background in AI. Yeah, so so training is where you take the language model that that is just a set of randomized weights, and you use a very large data set like um, the pile or our mountain data set, and you find you basically pre-train it with all that information. So you you get it to read every book in the universe, um, you get it to read all of Wikipedia and read it, uh, and and there's nothing particularly that doesn't have a particular problem in mind that it wants to solve. It just tries to understand the, the language by predicting, predicting the next word in the sentence. Uh, and that's a really, really good training, pre-training technique to extract a lot of the understanding of language, just, you know, how things are shaped in the world. What, mm. you know, is king related to queen and in what, in what direction is it related to, to, to those two terms? Um, Fine-tuning where the process was where the process of, of taking those language models and turning that knowledge into actionable results. So can it answer a question, right? With the knowledge that it's learned, can, can, will it now respond to a question? That's the, that's the fine tuning of the- Can you give us an example of that specific phenomenon, the fine tuning and how it works? Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's, it's primarily like a supervised technique, but sometimes it's, used, it's done using reinforcement learning. Um, in order to atta attain a model that can follow instructions, you need to specifically have a set of examples that, that do that thing. So um, OpenAI collected a large data set of, of fine-tuning examples by asking people to, 
to write answers to questions and also to write questions that, that could be answered. Uh, and then they took those question and answers um, and used those to fine tune the model. So they were like supervised examples um, to, to train their GPT-4 likely. Yeah, and obviously that's something that uh, requires uh, quite a great deal of time to do. Uh, talk a little bit about where we are in that process as, uh, as you think about it uh, in terms of this optimization and training aspect, mm -hmm. because this really is the key to getting higher quality results. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that the, the field is, is changing now because the real question is, can you inference these models? Can you get access to them? And they, as they're getting larger and larger, like GPT-4, there's a lot of expense going into, into training these models for sure. But the real expense for these companies like OpenAI is actually just having them online and giving access to people. So that's where BitTensor is really shining forth right now. And, and, that, and that's because of the, the, the cost of the compute power? It's the cost of the compute power. It's, it's you know, dollars. It's, it's $700,000 per day estimated for OpenAI just to run it, that technology of ChatGPT. Um, so it's hundreds of millions of dollars per year, which is actually magnitudes larger than what they likely expended to train GPT-4, which is interesting. And you know, it says something about, about how there's just an expense for AI to exist in the first place. <clears throat> so BitTensor is, is an inferencing network, and, and we are also a training network because we believe that the, the outputs of the models themselves can be used for training in a much more dense form. So you can fine tune your models very easily. You can train them, and that's what Vicuña did and Koala did. These models that were fine tuned actually trained off of OpenAI's endpoints or BARD endpoints from Google. There's, there's certainly a market arising for raw intelligence itself that we plug into. <clears throat> but I think really importantly, um, one of the things that we have is the ability to create unstoppable applications, uh, allow us to build a machine learning system or an, open AI, an AI company, which everybody can, can get a piece of and everybody can use and, and be sure that it won't turn off or, or turn against them in, or against their favor. So that's something that we, we have in spades. Let's talk a little bit about the numbers there, $700,000 uh, a day. Uh, mm -hmm times 365 back of the envelope, it's about a quarter of a billion dollars a year uh, to mm -hmm. operate the network. Let's talk a little bit about some of the numbers that you guys see in your business uh, in terms of demand for compute power uh, and in terms of the capacity to monetize that. Where is your business right now in terms of the numbers? Well, I mean, we, we have usage right now on a lot of our miners where they're just continuously churning out uh, responses. So they're at full capacity in some sense. Mm -hmm. Um, depends where they are in the system. It's hard to get total view on what's going on because the, the system is, is in some sense a black box. It's a peer-to-peer -peer network. We, we, if we get information from the miners, they have to expose that information. Uh, we don't have total visibility, which, is, which we require for there to be permissionlessness. Isn't um, the revenue, though, a kind of metadata that would flow off of that? The revenue comes from people that, that are using the system. Um, they're using the applications that are built on top of the system and the way that they monetize that is, is really up to them. So there are multiple heads into the network. We call them validator heads. These are the people that can basically use the technology um, and they are monetizing their usage. So that can be done in a num numerous types of ways. I mean, like I think there's a number of like core business models that are being created like standard open AI, here's an API key, you can go use the API key, you can plug that into a Lang chain application, or you can plug that into your auto GPT and, and, and there you go, you have, you have your unstoppable version of these applications. I mean, that's what we're seeing about, that's what we're seeing a lot of, because I think people are, are, are basically copying other business models. Um, but, but in the future, there might be, you know, many different types and, uh, and perhaps people will give things away for free. Uh, in having this decentralization is really important for, for not having just a single entity that can control uh, who gets to access the system. So uh, we are not the gatekeepers ourselves. We built the technology so that other people can monetize it. Um, and and we don't, people don't come to us and ask, can I build something? Right. It's permissionless uh, in that sense. But is there a, a metric about how much revenue is being generated from the compute power 
uh, in this decentralized world, is there any mechanism that you guys have in place to measure that across the network? Well, I mean, I think that um, the the best way to measure that would be what what are people buying the token for and how much inflation is there. So that would therefore reflect in some sense the demand for the, the currency and, and, and why people would want to use the network. So that that's there and that's obvious, but, uh, but that could also be driven partially by speculation. You know, right now we're building the technologies on top of, of, of BitTensor that are very akin to our competitors that have, you know, core business models. So we have a API endpoint that we're releasing with the foundation, for instance, that gives access, people access to this, net, this network of language models that would be one of the best in the world, if not, you know, as good as OpenAI. So we have a very similar business model to them. So let's talk about the token uh, you mentioned there, BitTensor, T-A-O, I guess it's pronounced Tau, uh, off uh, about, uh, call it about 40% on a trailing 12-month basis. Talk a little bit about uh, the functional mechanics of the token, the tokenomics, how the token participates in value creation in the Web3 network that you're building. Right. Well, Tau acts as a bandwidth token of sorts. Um, holding Tau gives you access to the network. Um, it's also what the miners are competing for. Access to this token as it inflates with uh, 21 million cap, same as, same as Bitcoin. So when you hold Tau on your endpoint, the miners will inference these requests for you. They'll do the job of, of attempting to open up their computation um, so that you can use it for your application. <clears throat> That's how Tau works in a nutshell. It's quite simple. Uh, and can you share with us any economic data about Tau in terms of uh, your sense of the degree of revenue that's flowing off that, how it's being priced, how it's being traded? I don't have any data on that, actually. I, I try not to spend too much time looking at the price here because honestly, I mean, as I said at the beginning of the interview with you, um, what we really care about here is the anti-fragile nature of the technology we're building. The market goes up, the market goes down, um, people compete. They, the miners get more efficient at what they're doing. That's something that 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 uh, a centralized corporation doesn't have. That's something that Bitcoin has in spades. It's something that we have in spades. The ability for us to adapt and be anti-fragile in the compute and the the technology we're building. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. I went and uh, was reading the white paper uh, this morning. I got, I think, to paragraph four uh, before the math got completely overwhelming, and I did not understand. Uh, the, just the, you know, there's really advanced mathematics behind this that you guys are citing in the paper. Uh, and I struggle to get my head around some of these technologies uh, and don't fully understand them, but it is just an incredibly interesting idea, uh, a decentralized way of processing machine learning and trying to uh, find a way to balance out those expenditures against the revenue that comes in. As you look forward here on this technology, Jacob, one, three, five years, where do you think we land with this? What do you see the future of this technology being? I think that we're we're walking into a future where access to AI is not something that's a given. Uh, I think that we're walking into a future where digital identity um, is going to be a serious concern for your ability to access these super powerful technologies and these tools. I, I think I'm, I like to imagine it like an analogy. Um, it, imagine if the internet itself had been invented by a Silicon Valley company. What if it was what if it was Sam Altman Mach two that invented the internet, and they were they were going to Congress and telling them that hey well we shouldn't we should probably have some regulations around this technology that we're calling the internet right now because people are watching pornography and 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 they're sending messages out there that we don't like, uh, and so we're gonna we're gonna put this on you guys and it probably would have been regulated and and it probably would have been made so that only a small number of people could actually use the technology that we considered. So important to our lives, we have a whole internet-based uh, economy. In fact, our entire economy is now internet-based, and that wouldn't have happened unless the technology had been fundamentally decentralized from the very beginning, built for almost a separate purpose, not by Silicon Valley profit-seeking motives. Um, and so that's why I I believe that that this decentralization, the ability to to build something and a technology that is important as AI in on a decentralized uh, footing. Um, is so important for the future of 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 humanity, really. And and where I where I see us going, you know, where I see us fitting in in the future of AI is is really on the is definitely on as a periphery to the the main players, 
something that people can use across the globe without any censorship. Um, a, a, a true internet-based artificial intelligence system. Um, and, and, I, and I think that the trajectory is going to be similar long-term um, to what, what's, what a technology like Bitcoin is going through right now, where it's being used by uh, governments and, and countries around the world that are outside of the, the major players. You look at what, what say El Salvador is doing, how they're building an entire economy based on Bitcoin that is going to be you know, a third pillar outside of, of you know, the current BRICS versus US uh, currency war, right? Uh, I think that, that building these decentralized networks allows for the smaller players to, to, to get a piece of, of this large technology without having any gatekeepers. Very interesting ideas. Jacob, final thoughts, key takeaways that you'd like to leave our viewers and our listeners with. I, I, really, I really think that now is the moment for, for this technology to come about, to give people access so that people can own something that, that is going to be the most important technology in the next hundred years, possibly for the rest of humanity. We, we have an opportunity to, to embed ourselves um, at the incentive layer, at the ownership layer, rather than, than with technologies like WorldCoin, digital identity, connected, ca- connecting us into um, a system of surveillance. So, so BitTensor is really driven by that principle. Let's make permissionless systems of AI that anybody can use and you know, come build with us. Jacob Seabes, founder of BitTensor, thank you for joining us. Thanks for watching, everyone. We'll be back again tomorrow with a special episode of Asking for a Friend, where we'll be going into the fundamentals of the blockchain technology. See you at 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, 5 p.m. London time. Thanks for watching, everybody. Have a great afternoon.